Live from San Francisco, it's The Cube. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live, The Cube in San Francisco, Moscone West for the Red Hat Summit 2018. Exclusive coverage. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of The Cube. I'm here with my co-host. John Troyer, who's the co-founder of Tech Reckoning, an advisory and community development firm. Our next guest is Jonathan, jo Jonathan Donaldson, technical director, office of the CTO, Google Cloud, former Cube alumni, formerly with Intel, been on before, now at Google Cloud for almost two years. Welcome back, good to see you. Good to see you too, it's great to be back. So, we had a great time last week with the Google Cloud folks at KubeCon in Denmark. Uh, Kubernetes, rock on the world. Really, when I hear the, world, with the word de facto standard and abstraction layers, I start to get my bells go up. Hmm, what's, let me look at that. Right. Some interesting stuff. You guys have been part of that from the beginning with the CNCF, uh, Google, Intel, among others. Really created a movement. Yeah. Congratulations. It's, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to the fact that, you know, we've been running containers for almost a dozen years, right? You know, four billion a week we launch and, and collapse. And we know that at some point as you know, Docker and, and containers really started to take over the new way of developing things that everyone is going to run into that scalability wall that, that we had run into years and years and years ago. And so Craig and, and the team um, at Google, right, again, I wasn't at Google at the time, but they had a really like, hey, let's take what we know from internally here and let's take those patterns and let's put them out there for the world to use and that became Kubernetes. And so I think that's really kind of the, the massive growth there is that people are like, wow, you've, you've, you've solved a problem but not from a, not from a science project, it's actually from like, something that's been running for, for a decade. And that's called Bohr, that's the tools that's that Google great, yeah. used to, that their SRE site reliable engineers use to massively provision manage, and, it, and they're all software engineers, so it's not like they're operators, they're all like, they're all like Google engineers. But I want to take a minute, if you can, to yeah. explain, because you're, you're new to your Google Cloud, you're in the industry, you've been around, you've helped form the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Foundation, you know cloud, you know tech. Google's changed a lot. And Google Cloud specifically has a narrative of, whoa, you know, they're one big cloud and they have an application called Google stuff and the enterprises are different. You've been there now for almost a year or more. Whatever year, yeah. What's Google Cloud like right now? Break the myths down around Google Cloud. What's the current stack? I know personally a lot of cloud DNA is coming in from the industry, they've been hiring, making some great progress. Take a minute to explain the Google Cloud. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. So again, it, it comes to back from where you started from. You know, so Google itself started from a scale, uh, consumer, you know, SaaS type of business. And so that I understood really well and we still understand obviously, you know, uptime and, and scalability really, really well. And I would say, you know, if you backtrack uh, several years ago, as the enterprise started to really look at public clouds and Google Cloud itself started to spin up, that was probably not, they probably didn't understand exactly all of the things that an enterprise would need as really at, the, at that point in time, really no one cloud understood any of the enterprise uh, specifically. And so what they did is they started hiring in people um, like myself and others that are in the group that I'm in. They're you know, former CIOs of large enterprise companies or former VPs of engineering. And really kind of our job in the office of CTO for Google Cloud is to help um, with the product teams to help them build the products that enterprises need to be able to use the public cloud. And then also work with you know, some of those top enterprise customers to help them adopt those technologies. And so I think now that if you look at Google Cloud, right, they understand enterprise really, really well, certainly from the product and the technology perspective, and I think it's just going to get better. I interviewed Jennifer Lin, I had a one-on-one -on -one with her, I didn't publish it, it was more of a briefing. Um, she runs product management on the security yeah, side. Fantastic. So, you know, we, she's checking the boxes. So the table stakes are kind of like set for Google. I know you got to do some basic things to catch up to get in the cloud. But also you, you, know, you have partnerships. Google Next is coming up, theCUBE will be there. Um, Red Hat's a partner. Talk about that, that relationship with, with Red Hat and partners. So right. you're very partner-centric with are. Google Cloud, uh, and, then, and that's important right. in the enterprise. Yeah, What's there tends to be kind of two main areas that we focus on from what we consider you know, the right way to do cloud. One of them is open source, right? So having the, which again, aligns perfectly with Red Hat, is you know, putting the technologies that uh, we want customers to use and that we think customers should use in, a, in open source, right? Kubernetes is an example of those, Istio and others uh, that we've put out there, examples of those. You know, a lot of the open source projects that we all take for granted today were started from white papers that we had put out at one point in time, kind of explaining how uh, we do those things. Um, Red Hat, from an and from a partner perspective, I think that that follows along, right? We think that the way that, that customers 
are going to consume these technologies, certainly enterprise customers are, through those partners that they know and trust. And so you know, having a good flourishing ecosystem of partners that surround Google Cloud is absolutely key to what we do. And they love multi-cloud too. I mean, they love multi-cloud, and we do too. I mean, the idea is that we, don't, we want customers to come to Google Cloud and stay there because they want to stay there, because they like us for who we are and for what we offer them, not because they're locked into a specific service or technology. And you know, things like Kubernetes, things like containers, um, being open source, right, allows them to you know, take their tool chains all the way from their laptop to their own cloud inside their own data center to any you know, cloud provider they want. And we think, you know, hopefully, they'll naturally gravitate towards us over One time. One of the things I like about the cloud is that there's, there's a flywheel, if you will, of expertise. Like I look at Amazon, for instance, they're, they're getting a lot of metadata of the kinds of workloads that are on their cloud, so they can learn from that and turn that into an advantage for them or not, or for their customers and how they could do that. That's their business decision. Google has a lot of um, flywheel action going on. A lot of Android devices <laughs> connected in the Google system. You have a lot of services that you can bring to bear in the cloud. How are you guys looking at, say, from a security standpoint alone, that would be a very valuable service to have if I can tap into all the security goodness of Google around what spear phishing is out there, or things right. of that nature. So are you guys thinking like that in terms of services for, for customers? How does that play so out? So where, where, you know, where we, so we're, we're we're very consistent on what we consider is we, privacy is number one for our customers, right? Whether they're consumer customers or whether they're enterprise customers, right? The, where we would use you know, data, like I, you mentioned a lot of things, but where we would use like some data across customer bases are typically you know, for security things, right? Mm -hmm. So where we would see some sort of security um, you know, impact or an attack or something like that. This started to impact many customers and we would then kind of aggregate that information. It's not really customer information, it's just like, yeah. you know, like you said, you're metadata not, or themes or trends, it. right? And yeah. and yeah, we're not monetizing it, but we're actually using it to protect customers. But when a customer actually uses Google Cloud, that instance, those you know, that is their hermetically sealed um, you know, environment. In fact, you know, there's, I think we just came out um, recently with you know, even the transparency aspects of it where you know, and, you know, it's almost like the two, two key type of uh, access for you know, if our engineers have to help the customer with a troubleshooting ticket, that ticket actually has to be open, that kind of unlocks one door, the customer has to say yes, that unlocks the other door, and then they can go in there and help the customer do things to solve whatever the problem is. And each one of those is transparently and permanently logged and then the customer can at any point in time go in and see those things. So we are taking you know, customer privacy from an enterprise yeah. and perspective. And you guys are also a whole building from Google proper. Like yep. it's a completely different campus, so that's, that's important right. to note. It is, and, and a lot of this just chains on from you know, yeah. Google proper itself. I mean, uh, if you understood just how crazy and fanatical they are um, about you know, keeping things uh, in, inside and secret and propri not proprietary, but like not yeah. allowing the data, customer data out, even on the consumer side, um, it would well, be- Well, you got to amplify server. that, I understand, but what I also I see a good side of that, which is there's a lot of resources you're bringing to bear, like lear or learnings. Yeah, absolutely. The SRE concept, for instance, is uh, to me really powerful because you <laughs> Google had to build that out themselves, right? Right. This is now a paradigm we're seeing a cloud scale here with the cloud native uh, market, bringing in all new capabilities, at scale, horizontally scalable, fully synchronous, microservices architecture. This future is a complete game changer on functionality yep. at the different scale points. So there's no longer <laughs> the operators right. provisioning storage here. And this is what we've been doing for years and years and years. That's how all of Google itself, that's all search and ads and Gmail and everything runs in containers, all orchestrated by you know, Borg, which is our version of, of Kubernetes. And so we're really just bringing those leanings um, into the Google Cloud, or learnings into Google Cloud and to our, those customers. Jonathan, uh, yep. machine learning and AI has been a big topic this week yep. uh, on OpenShift. Obviously, that's a big strength of Google Cloud right. as well. Can you talk, drill down on that story and talk about you know, what Google Cloud is bringing and, on, you know, and, and machine learning on OpenShift sure. in general? Give us a little picture of what's yeah, running. So I think, um, I think they showed the service broker, some of the service broker stuff, and I think they, um, did they show some of the, the Kubeflow stuff, which is you know, kind of taking some of the machine learning uh, and Kubernetes underneath OpenShift. Like, I think those are like, very, very interesting for people that want to start getting into using, uh, you know, auto ML, which is kind of you know roll your own machine learning, or even the voice or vision APIs to enhance their products. And I think that that's uh, those are going to be keys. Easing the adoption of those, making them really, really easy to consume, 
um, is what's going to drive you know, the, the significant you know, ramp on using those types of technologies. Uh, one of the key touch points here has been the fact that this stuff is real world and yes. production ready, right? Yeah, the fact that the enterprise uh, architects are now rolling out apps you know, within days or weeks. Right. So one of those things that's now real is ML, and, and even uh, in the opening keynote, right, they talked about using a little bit of it uh, to uh, optimize the, the, the scheduling and which, what, what sessions were in which rooms. Yep. As you talk to enterprises, right, it does, it, it, it does seem like this stuff is being baked into real enterprise apps today. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Um, so I certainly can't give any specific examples because I think what you're seeing is that a lot of enterprises, or, you know, a lot of companies are kind of like, they're looking at that like, oh, this is our new secret sauce, right? It always used to be like they had some, you know, interesting feature before that, you know, they, a competitor would have to keep up with or catch up with, but I think they're looking at machine learning as a way to enhance that customer experience, right? Um, so that it's a much more intimate experience. It feels much more tailored to whomever is using their product. And I think that you're seeing a lot of those types of things um, that people are starting to bake into their, into their products. You know, we've, again, this is one of these things where we've been using machine learning you know, for almost 10 years inside Google, things like for Gmail, even in the early days like spam filtering. I mean, something just kind of you know, mundane like that, or we even used it, turned it on in our data centers to drop our, you know, because it does a really good job of, you know, lowering the PUE, which is the power efficiency in data centers. And those are very mundane things, but we have a lot of experience with that, and we've, we're exposing that through these, these products, and we're starting to see people, customers, you know, gravitate to grab onto those to go, you know, instead of having to hard code something, that is a one-to-many kind of thing, right? I, I, I may, may get it right or I may have to tweak it over time, but I'm still kind of generalizing what the use cases are that my customers want to see. Once they turn on machine learning um, inside their applications, it feels much more tailored um, to, the, to the customer's use cases. Machine learning as a service seems to be a big hot button that's coming out. How are you guys looking at the technical direction um, from the cloud uh, with the enterprise? Because you have three classes of enterprise. You have the early adopters, the power, front, front cutting edge, then you have the fast followers, and you have kind of everybody else. Right. The everybody else and fast followers, they know about Kubernetes. Some might even, what is Kubernetes? So right. you what have kind of a level of progress where people are. Um, how are you guys looking at addressing those three areas? Because you know, you could blow them away with TensorFlow as a server. <laughs> Whoa, I don't right. I don't, I'm just trying to get my storage LUNs moving to a right. cloud operation. So there's different parts of the journey. Yes, absolutely. Is there a technical direction that addresses these? What are you guys doing? So typically we'll work with those customers to help them kind of plot, you know, chart the path for all those things. And, and they, you know, they will, and making it easy for them to use and consume, um, you know, machine learning is still, you know, if, unless you are a, a st stats major or you're, you know, a, a, a math major, a lot of the algorithms and understanding kind of, you know, linear algebra and things like that are still very complex topics. But, you know, then again, so was networking and BGP and things like OSPF back uh, a few exactly. years ago. So, your know, technology always evolves and the thing that you can do is you can just help pull people along uh, the continuum there by making it easy for them to use and to provide a lot of education. And so we work with customers on all ends of the spectrum. Okay. So if, if it's just like, hey, how do I modernize my applications or how do I even just put them into the cloud? We have teams that can help do that or you know, can educate on that. If there are customers who are like, I really want to go do something special with uh, you know, maybe refactoring my applications, I really want to get the cloud native experience, we help with that. And those customers that are, say, you know, I really want to find out this machine learning you think, how can I actually make that an impactful uh, portion of, of my company's portfolio? We, we can certainly help with that. And it's just a, you know, there's no one, and typically you'll find in, in any large enterprise, because there, you know, there'll be some people on each one of those camps. Yeah, and they also want to, they do, will put their toe in the water here and there. Uh, the question I have on, uh, for you guys is, you got a lot of goodness going on. You're not trying to match Amazon speed for speed, feature for feature. You guys are picking your shots uh, that are core to Google, that's clear. Is there a use case or set of building blocks that are, that are highly adopted with you guys now, and as Google gets out there and gets some uh, penetration in the enterprise, what's the use, what are the, uh, the key things that you see with successes for you guys out of the gate? I mean, is there, is there a basic building? Amazon's got EC2 and S3. Right. What, what are you guys seeing as the kind of the core building blocks of Google Cloud from a product standpoint that's getting the most traction today? So I think we're seeing you know, the same types of building blocks that the other cloud providers are. I think you know, some of the differences is we, we look at security differently because of where, again, where we grew up. We do things like live migration of virtual machines if you're using virtual machines because we've had to do that internally. Um, so I think there are some differences on just even some of the kind of the basic block and tackling type of things. But I do think that if you look at just moving to the cloud 
in and of itself is not enough, right? I mean, that's just kind of, that's a stepping stone. We truly believe that, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, you know, cloud native style of applications, you know, uh, containers, uh, things like service meshes, right? Those things that kind of reduce the operational burdens and improve the rate of, uh, you know, new feature introduction, as well as the machine learning things. I think that that's what people tend to come to Google for. And we think that that's kind of the, a lot of what people are going to stay with us for. I overheard a quote I want to get your uh, reaction to. I wrote it down. It says, I need to get away from VPNs and firewalls. I need user and application layer security with unfishable access. Otherwise, I'm never safe. Right. So this is kind of a user perspective or customer perspective. Yeah. Obviously with cloud there's no perimeters, so you got, you got phishing problems. Right? You know, speed phishing is one big problem. Security, you mentioned that. Um, and then another quote I had was, Kubernetes is about running frameworks and it's about changing the way applications are going to be built over time. And that's where I think SRE and Istio right. is very interesting in Kubeflow. Yes. This is a modern architecture for- There's a Kubevert out there where you can run a VM inside a container, which is actually what we do internally too. So that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice. Yeah, how relevant is that, those concepts? Because are you hearing that as well on the customers? Because that, you know, that's pain point. But also the, the new modern software development's a future way to do things. So there's pain point, I need some aspirin for that, and then I need some growth with the new applications being built and hiring talent. Uh, is that consistent with how you guys see it? So which one should I tackle? So you talked about- VPNs, so let's do the VPNs, VPNs first, that's my okay. favorite one. So one of the most, let me kind of give you the backstory. So one of the most interesting things when I came to Google, having come from other you know, large enterprise vendors before this was um, there's no VPNs. Like we don't even have it on our laptop. They have this thing called Beyond Corp, right? Which is essentially now productized um, as the identity wear proxy, which is it actually takes, uh, we trust no one or nothing with anything, right? It's the, not the walled garden style of approach uh, of you know, firewall type VPN security. What we do is, based upon the resource you're going to request access for, and are you on a trusted machine? So are you one that, that corporate has given you? And do you have uh, two-factor authentication that corporate, you know, not only your, it's what you have and what you know, right? And so they take all of those things into, into awareness. Like, is this the laptop that's registered to you? Right, is this, do you have your two-factor authentication? Have you authenticated to it? And it's a trusted platform boom, then I can gain access to the resources. But they will also look for things like, if all of a sudden, you know, uh, you were sitting here, and I'm in San Francisco, but you know, something from you know, some you know, f uh, country in Asia pops up with my credentials on it, they're going to they're gonna slam the door shut going, there's no way that you can be in two places at one time. And so that's what the Identity Aware Proxy or Beyond Corp does, uh, kind of in a nutshell. And so we use that everywhere, internally, externally, and so that's the way that we, one of the ways that we do security differently is without VPNs. And that's actually in front of, you know, a lot of the GCP technologies today that you can actually leverage that. So I would say we take- So it's rethinking security. Rethinking security, again, based upon a long yeah, history, yeah. and not only that, but what we use internally uh, from our corporate perspective. Um, and now to get to the- Istio, the Kubeflow question, yeah. is more of the the, the way software gets run. I mean, we have one quote from one of the ex-Googler who left Google and went out to a, another company. She goes, she was blown away, but this is the way people ship software. She's like, she was a fish out of water. She's right. like, oh my God, where's Borg? You know, like yeah. we, we, we do waterfall. So there's a, a new approach that open source communities and people expect. Right. That's the, this notion of Kubeflow and, uh, and orchestration. So that's kind of a modern, it requires training and commitment. Right. That's the upside, right? right? Fix the aspirin, so identity proxy cool. Future of software development architecture. Yeah, I think one of the, the strong things that you're going to see in, in software development is, I think the days of people running it differently in development and then in sandbox and then in, and, you know, in testing QA and then in prod are, are over, right? They want, to, they want to basically have that same experience no matter where they are. They want to you know, not have to do the, you know, Crossing your fingers, if it, you know, if it, remember it used to get, you know, now it gets reddited or it got slash dotted way back in the past and yeah. things would, would collapse. Like those days of people, you know, being able to put up with those types of issues are over. And so I think that you're going to continue to see uh, the development and the style of microservices containers, you know, orchestrated by something that can do auto scaling and healing, uh, like Kubernetes. You're going to see them then start to use kind of that that base layer to add new capabilities on top, which is where we see Kubeflow, which is like, hey, how can I go put you know, scalable machine learning on top of containers and on top of uh, Kubernetes? And you even see, like I said, you see people saying, well, I don't really want to run two different data planes um, and do kind of the inception model. Like, if I can lay down a base layer of Kubernetes and containers, yeah. 
then I can run bare metal workloads against the bare metal. If I need to run, launch a virtual machine, I'll just launch that inside the yeah. container. And that's what Qvert's doing. So we're seeing a lot of this very interesting stuff. Yeah, creativity. Uh, creativity. Great, talk about your role in the, in the office of the CTO. I know we got uh, a couple minutes left, I want to get it out sure. there. What is the role of the CTO? Obviously, Brian Steve, formerly a Red Hat yeah. uh, executive. Is your, yeah, is, Brian's uh, our CTO, he used to run a big chunk of the engineering for Google Cloud, absolutely. And so, what is the office's charter? You mentioned some CIOs, former CIOs are in there. Is it the think tank? Is it the, uh, is it the command and control ivory tower? What, I mean, what's the role of the office? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, um, you know, Diane Green and, and Brian Stevens and other executives decided, you know, if we want to really understand what the enterprise uh, needs from us from a cloud perspective, we really need to have some people um, that have kind of walked in those shoes and, you know, that they, they can't just be like, it can't just be Diane or can't just be Brian, who also had a big breadth of experience there, but, you know, it, two people can't do that uh, for every customer or for every product. And so they kind of, they instituted this, uh, the office of CTO, I tapped Will Granis, um, again, you know, had been in Boeing before, uh, you know, been in the uh, military and so tapped him to kind of build this thing. And they went and they looked for people that had experience, you know, former VPs of engineering, former CIOs, uh, you know, we have people from GE, oil and gas, we have people from Boeing, we have people from, you know, uh, Pixar, like you name it, across each of the different verticals, healthcare, um, we have those in the office CTO, and probably I think 25 to 30 of us now, I can't remember exact numbers. And really what our day-to-day -day life is like is working significantly with the, the product managers and the engineering teams to help facilitate you know, more and more engineer, uh, enterprise focused engineering into the products. And then working with uh, enterprise customers, um, kind of those, the, the, the big enterprise customers that we want to see successful and helping drive their success as they consume Google Cloud. So being kind of that conduit directly so in market with, with customer, big nut customers, getting requirements, helping facilitate exactly. product management yeah. function and as from well. an engineering perspective. So we're, uh, yeah, we actually sit in the engineering organization. Yeah. Make sure you're making the good bets. Yes, exactly. <laughs> great, well thanks for coming on theCUBE, thanks for sharing thanks the insight. For again. Great to have you on, a great insight again. Google, always great uh, technology, great uh, enterprise mojo going on right now. Of course, theCUBE will be at Google Next this July, so we'll be have live coverage from Google Next here in San Francisco at that time. Thanks for coming on, Jonathan, really appreciate it. Looking forward to more coverage. Stay with us for more day three as we start to wrap up our live coverage of Red Hat Summit 2018. We'll be back after this short break. <laughs>